OK, uh, welcome back to class, everyone. So this is the second, uh, second week of class, the second week of complex analysis, and the last week of complex analysis, probably. Um, so I'm almost ready to tell you the most important uh, facts from complex analysis that we're going to use when we solve partial differential equations and Laplace transforms, inverse Laplace transforms, and so on. Uh, so things are building up and getting interesting. Now, what did we learn about complex functions in the last class? What were kind of the most important things we've been learning about complex functions so far? Some of them are. Some of the complex functions are analytical. And what does it mean to be an analytic function in the complex plane? Sorry, say it again. OK, you can take the derivative. What else? Yeah, it has a convergent Taylor series. What else? Sorry? Um, the real and imaginary parts solve Laplace's equations. Yep, so they're harmonic functions, super important. Uh, what else? What do they look like? What's the shape and geometry of these functions? They're basically smooth. Smooth is another word for differentiable. And what are some examples of non-analytic features that are not smooth? Singularity, so if I just have like a black hole, or what else? Step functions, if I had cusps, like I'm just making real valued analogs, like a cusp is not uh, differentiable at that point, so that wouldn't work either. So basically, at this point, we have a pretty good idea of what analytic means. Um, maybe not the most mathematically rigorous set of definitions ever, but we, we have a gut feeling for what an analytic function means. Um, and so today, what we're going to talk about is how to handle simple functions that are barely not analytic. They're basically analytic everywhere, except at a couple of singularities. OK? Um, so I'm just going to say, recall from last lecture that if f of z is analytic in some domain d, then the closed contour integral of f equals 0 if c is closed and it's a subset of D. And D has to be a simply connected domain, which means that it doesn't have any holes in it. So I'm just going to draw this picture one more time because it's really important. So we have our complex plane. And let's say I have some nice domain D that doesn't have any holes in it. Okay, And if I have any closed contour C inside of this domain, so it can be some weird looking thing, but as long as it's closed and it's inside this nice simply connected domain D, then this contour integral, integral around C of my function equals 0. Right, that was one major, major result that we had. This is the cauchy gorsoff theorem, really important. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. We also had the fact that if we had a maybe a, a weird domain that is not simply connected. So maybe there's some weird singularities in here. I can take any two closed contours and continuously deform them into each other. So this red contour has the same integral as this red contour. Okay? And we proved that in the last class kind of geometrically by doing some surgery and using the cauchy gorsoff theorem. That was the last thing we did on the last lecture. Okay? These integrals, let's call this C1 and C2. So integral around C1 equals integral around C2. 
but those do not necessarily equal zero because the singularities might mess up my integration. Okay, uh, one last thing just in case I just want to test to make sure that everyone's understanding things pretty well. So let's say that we have that case with some singularities in the middle. What if I have my integral here? What if that is c? Then the integral around c of f of z dz is what? Zero. Zero. Right? Because it's in a domain D that's simply connected and it's analytic in that domain. Good. All right. Okay, so we're ready to do some pretty cool stuff now. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things throughout the lecture today and on Wednesday. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to start thinking about. So we know that these two contour integrals equal each other, but we don't know. We don't know what it equals, what these integrals equal. So we're going to start figuring out how to do contour integrals in analytic domains that surround singularities. Okay, This is going to be a very common thing that we're going to do. This is going to come up in Laplace transforms um, a lot. So we're going to try to figure out what this equals. It's good that they equal each other, but we also want to know what they actually equal themselves. So that's one thing we're going to do. Um, we're going to code it up in MATLAB and actually start computing these contour integrals you know, numerically by hand to confirm our mathematical intuition. Uh, and then we're going to use these results to solve some really difficult and really important integrals that we didn't think we could solve before. Okay, so that's the agenda for the next two lectures, maybe three. And once I've done that, I'm pretty much happy with what you know about complex analysis. Okay. There will be little bits here and there that I'll tell you about. OK. Um, OK, so all polynomials and convergent power series are analytic. OK, this is something I've already told you. It's true. And so we have examples like if you have z minus a to the power n, that's a polynomial in z. a is just a complex number. Um, so this is it's analytic for n equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. And it's not analytic for n equals minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, dot, dot, dot. OK, so if I had positive powers of n here, this would just be a normal polynomial. And it would, yes, in fact, be analytic. But if I had something like 1 over z minus a, or 1 over z minus a squared, or cubed, or to the fourth, or whatever, these are not analytic. These have singularities at z equals a. Right? There's a singularity at z equals a here, singularity at z equals a here, blows up to infinity. OK. So what we're going to figure out is how to do contour integrals around these types of functions for all powers of n. These are going to be building blocks. We're going to figure out how to do these contour integrals, and it's going to tell us how to do other more interesting contour integrals. OK, good. So OK, so case one is for, um, let's see. Case one is for n equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. And n equals minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, dot, dot, dot. And case 2 is going to be n equals minus 1. OK, this is a little bit weird. Why am, I, why am I having this special case here where n is minus 1 and all of the other cases up here? It's because if I integrate this polynomial, or this, this power function of z minus a, for any of these powers, I get that the integral 
of z minus a to the n dz is equal to z minus a to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And you can evaluate that at the starting and end points of this contour, which for a closed loop are z naught to z naught equals 0. This is just because these functions are easy to integrate. We can actually integrate you know, z minus a to the n just like we did from regular calculus. Except if n was negative 1, what's the integral of 1 over z minus a? Log of z minus a. So that's why it's its own special case here, because it's different. So that equals log of z minus a, evaluated somehow on this contour. I'm going to say z naught plus to z naught minus. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. OK? Um, maybe I'll just call this from z1 to z2. And this is not equal to 0 because our log function of z is multi-valued. Okay? Remember we have, um, let's say that this is real z imaginary of z, and this is um, the imaginary part of z, of uh, log z. then we have this kind of spiral staircase thing that goes forever in the positive and negative direction. So for example, if I do a closed loop C that contains the point 0, let's say that my closed loop in the real plane looked like that. Then in log, I'm actually going all the way up here, and I've just picked up a factor of 2 pi in the imaginary direction. Okay, So intuitively, I'm going to prove this. We're going to go through like the actual math and show that this is exactly what we get. But what we actually get is that this integral does not equal 0. It equals 2 pi i. Okay, I'm going to I'm actually going to show that this is true in two different ways. This is just a cartoon. This is just to convince you that it might be more interesting than zero. OK, so what do we have just to summarize? So all polynomials with positive powers are analytic, and so they have to integrate to zero, right? We know that. But z minus a to a negative power, like negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, are not analytic. But most of them also integrate to 0 because they're just easy to integrate, and they cancel out. Okay? The only case that doesn't integrate to 0 is the power of negative 1. So if I contour integral 1 over z minus a, that is the only power of z minus a that when you have a closed contour integral will not equal 0. I just want you to know the basic facts before we start proving things. This is really, really important because almost every power of z minus a to the n integrates to 0, except this one very special one. Yeah? In these cases, aren't you considering a closed curve that doesn't include z equals a? Um, these all include any closed curve. This is true for, uh, for any c especially those that include um, z minus a. And here, um, what if my closed curve was out here in the real and imaginary axes? That contour integral of 1 over z minus a would equal 0, because it's actually analytic out here. OK, so this is only if your contour integral encl encloses z equals a that things get weird. Yeah? How is it that uh, we only make one rotation? Could we have made two rotations and gotten like a full answer of four or five? Um, I mean, we're defining this contour integral to be one. one rotation in z, in the z plane. 
Um, trying to think if I could make a weird contour that had more, and I'm sure I could. Um, I guess I could do something like that, and that would have two enclosures, and that would give me four pi i. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's see uh, why this is true. Okay, so we're going to have two different approaches to show that um, this case 2 is equal to 2 pi i. Um, I'm going to flip the order in my notes because I think that the case, so two approaches to show that the integral of 1 over z minus a dz equals 2 pi I. Okay, so first, let's just do this integral like we have. So we have integral of c dz over z minus a is equal to log of z evaluated at, I'm going to call them z1 and z2 for now. But really what we have is that this log of z we can expand as it's log of the radius of z, right? z equals r e to the i theta, log of the radius, plus i times theta plus 2 pi k. OK? And here, we're integrating from 0 to 2 pi. in theta. This is in theta. So the way we think about this is that our contour integral, whatever it was, remember, by that theorem, we can deform this into another contour integral that has a fixed constant radius. And that's what we're going to be integrating here. So we're integrating with a constant radius, and we're integrating in theta from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so when you plug all this in, the constant radius, you essentially get log of r minus log of r. And whatever k is, you get 2 pi k minus 2 pi k. And the only thing that comes out of this integral after you evaluate at 2 pi and at 0 is 2 pi i minus 0. Okay, so essentially what we did was we deformed our contour c onto a circle. And then we just integrated in polar coordinates from theta equals 0 to 2 pi. OK. So another more formal way to do that, which is essentially the same thing that we're doing, we're going to deform our curve onto a circle. And so we have z minus a equals r e to the i theta. Sorry, this is centered around the point A. So it's really z minus A is r e to the i theta. OK, so if this is z minus A, then what is dz? What is my differential dz? How do I take the exact differential of, of this thing? Well, z is just this plus a constant a. And so the differential is the derivative of this with respect to r dr plus the derivative of this with respect to theta d theta. Now, r is completely not changing, so dr is 0. And I just get i r e to the i theta d theta. And this is because r is constant because we deformed our contour onto a circle. Okay? And so this is 
you know, now it's actually pretty easy to evaluate this, so we're going to integrate from C, uh, Z minus A inverse DZ is the same as integrating with a constant R from theta equals 0 to 2 pi, and we're going to integrate DZ divided by Z minus A. So I R e to the I theta over R e to the I theta d theta. And lo and behold, all of these terms cancel. Right, my Z minus A cancels with my DZ, and all that's left is this little I. And so that equals the integral from 0 to 2 pi of i d theta, which equals 2 pi i. Okay, so that's three ways that I've shown you how to um, integrate this simple first order pole at A. We can actually expand log out and evaluate log across one of these branches. We can go to polar coordinates directly and actually integrate from 0 to 2 pi. And that's the same thing that we have here pictorially, which is when we do a closed curve in the z-plane, we climb to another branch of log and we picked up 2 pi i in the process. Okay. The basic fact that matters, and this is you know years from now, you probably won't remember all of the details of how to prove this, but the thing that matters um, is this. This is really what matters. The closed integral of the 1 over z minus a is equal to 2 pi i, and that's the only interesting case. Everything else goes to 0. Okay, there will be a lot more stuff we can do with this. This is probably one of the most important results in complex analysis. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah? Can you re-explain pictorially like, why case 1 doesn't have that shift? Okay. Um, so log of z is multi-valued, which is why when we go around, we, we jump to a new value, and we add 2 pi i. This function is single-valued. Its inverse is multi-valued. Remember when we took the, the fourth root of 1, we had four values, and we took the third root of negative 1, we had three values. The inverse of a integer power of z is multi-valued, but this is single value. There's only one value to this function. And so going around, you don't, you don't climb to a new branch because there's only one branch of this. That's kind of pictorially, you know, it, it doesn't have this weird spiral staircase geometry. Even if this thing has a singularity, it's still, you know, going down or maybe it's, you know, going up, but it doesn't, when you go around, you're not on a new branch like you are with log because this function is single valued. That's pictorially why it's true. Even though it's not analytic, it still has this simple, simple branch geometry. There's kind of one branch of this. OK, good. Other questions? OK. Um, trying to think of what order to tell you things in for the maximal impact. Um, OK, so I'll tell you, today is really important. I told you this basic, most important result. This is really, 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 really important. Um, I'm going to call it pivotal. And I think I know how to spell pivotal now. There's a O, pivotal. Okay. And I'm going to show you the next uh, most pivotal result, and I'm going to try to do it in time to show you how to code it up in MATLAB, like we were doing on the homework. 
OK, so armed with this result, we can say something very interesting. OK, so this is another named formula, the Cauchy integral formula. I call it CIF sometimes. OK, and the basic idea is the following. Let's say that we have a function f, which is analytic everywhere. And then we divide it by z minus a. So we insert a singularity at z minus a. OK, so if f of z is analytic, you know, inside and on a closed curve C. And if the point A, this A is just a complex number, so I'm going to say it's in the complex plane, so some complex number A. And if A is inside our contour C, then I'm going to draw a picture in a minute. OK, then the integral around that contour of my function divided by z minus a is equal to 2 pi i times my function evaluated at that special point a. OK, and I'm going to draw this picture because it's really, really important. OK, so I have some domain D that's nice and simply connected. And I have some contour C inside of there. So if I didn't have this denominator, what would my integral be? Zero, right? Because f is analytic inside of D. So this contour integral of f of z would be zero. But there is some point A here in the middle where I'm artificially adding in a singularity at A, right? I'm adding in a pole at z equals A. This blows up to infinity. And this integral no longer equals 0 because it's not, like, this function's not analytic in D anymore. But using the result we just proved, we're going to be able to show that this integral equals 2 pi i times the function value at A. F is defined at A. F is smooth at A. Like, we have an F of A. It's this function that blows up at z equals A. And we're going to find that Lots and lots and lots of difficult integrals that we want to do can be written in this form. So for example, if you do an inverse Laplace transform, you're going to have something like e to the minus st divided by s minus a. Right? That looks a lot like an inverse Laplace transform. The bounds are going to be weird. But you're going to have an analytic function with a pole at z equals a. OK, this is something we'll, we'll do probably on Wednesday, is actually use this formula to take the inverse Laplace transform. Instead of using lookup tables, we can actually derive them now. OK, um, so this is called the Cauchy integral formula. Super, super important. Um, it's actually pretty easy to prove that this is true. OK. Um, any ideas how I might go about doing this? What would you do? Let's say that you wanted to show that this is true. How would you go about taking this integral?
I'll let you think about it for a little while. Well, what is this looks a lot like this term looks a lot like the integral of f of a divided by z minus a dz around my contour, right? f of a is just a number. And if I took that number times this integral, right, I would get f of a times my contour integral of 1 over z minus a dz. And what does this contour integral equal? 2 pi i. So that is 2 pi i f of a, which is what I end up getting. So that looks a lot like this. So what I can do is the following. So I'm going to essentially take my big integral that's in the red box, and I'm going to break it up into that integral that I wrote on the bottom plus the remainder. And I'm going to show that the remainder has to equal 0. OK, good. So what do we have? We have the integral of f of z divided by z minus a dz around my contour. I can break it up into two integrals. I can say that this is equal to the integral of f of a dz over z minus a plus the integral of f of z minus f of a divided by z minus a. Right? If I add these two together, then my f of a's cancel, and I get the integral that I'm trying to solve. Okay. So we just showed that this i1, this first integral, is equal to 2 pi i f of a. And what we're going to show now is that the second integral equals 0, thus proving that this equals 2 pi i f of a. OK, so now we have to show that i2 equals 0. Um, which we can do. OK, so I have some contour, and I have some point A. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this integral, and I'm going to shrink it so that I'm very, very, very close to this point A. We can do that, right? This expression here has a singularity at z equals A, but it's analytic everywhere else. So I can take this big curve here, and I can continuously deform it until it's kind of epsilon close to the singularity. I can make it a little circle as small as I want around that singularity. This is, I'm, all, I'm using the formula that we derived in the last uh, part of the last lecture, that you can continuously deform these integrals in a domain that's uh, analytic. OK, and so I'm going to call this a little C delta. It's a delta circle. C delta is a delta radius circle around my point A. So I2 is this thing. And I can continuously deform this contour into C delta of f of z minus f of a divided by z minus a dz. OK? Now, when you learned calculus, how many of you learned about deltas and epsilons? Delta epsilon proofs and what it means to be able to take the limit. Um, so the idea of something being differentiable is that f of z minus f of a. Let's say that I want to choose z 
let's say that I want f of z minus f of a to be less than epsilon. So I can do this for any epsilon you name by choosing z minus a less than delta. So what this means, for a function to be differentiable, for a function to be smooth, and for the derivative to exist at a point a, then for any epsilon you can name, I can give you a delta such that if my z is delta close to a, then my f of z is epsilon close to f of a. This is the delta epsilon definition of the limits and derivative. OK? And so the idea is, I'm going to make this numerator less than epsilon, super, super small epsilon. And I can do that by choosing delta smaller and smaller and smaller. So this integral is less than or equal to, or maybe the absolute value of my integral is less than or equal to the integral of epsilon divided by z minus a dz over c delta. Now, I do pick up a 2 pi i here, but I get 2 pi i times epsilon. And I can choose, so my function f was, in fact, analytic at this point. It is differentiable. So I can do this delta epsilon type proof for any epsilon you name. I could do it for epsilon is 1 millionth or 1 billionth or 1 times 10 to the minus a bajillion. And I can take the limit as epsilon goes to 0. And I can make this delta circle smaller and smaller and smaller. And I can force this integral to be less than or equal to any epsilon you can name that's positive. Which is another way of saying that this second integral has to equal 0. I can bound it from above by any positive real number you can name. You name a number, I'll make my circle that much smaller and we'll make i less than that number. OK, this is just a long way of saying that the second integral equals 0, this f of z part. And the only thing that we're left with is this contour integral with f of a in the numerator, which establishes this Cauchy integral formula. OK, really important formula, important enough to get some stars. I feel bad. I just realized this morning that if anyone was colorblind, then this wouldn't make any sense. Um, or at least you wouldn't get the extra emphasis, so I apologize. Um, this is going to make it possible for us to solve lots and lots and lots of powerful integrals that we could have never solved in the real, the real domain. OK? Um, there's a story that one time Feynman was doing a really important calculation, and he used uh, an integral table for one of the integrals he had. Um, and it happened to be a wrong, like a mistake, a typo in the integral table, which he then found out later because his formulas weren't working. And he vowed to never do another integral using a table. This is before Mathematica. Um, he vowed to never do another integral uh, using a table again. So we always did them by hand. And this is probably the sim single most useful formula for computing really nasty integrals by hand. <laughs> OK, so all of those crazy integrals that Mathematica can do and that are in lookup tables that you have no idea how to do, you can basically solve them using this formula and some tricks that I'm going to show you on Wednesday and Friday. OK. Um, so I'm going to code some of this up in MATLAB, and we're going to do this example for a couple of analytic functions. Like we're going to choose f to be e to the z, or sine of z, or cos of z, some analytic function. And then we're going to add in a singularity and show that we get this true result. Um, any questions before we do that? Who remembers what the function is in the homework that I am doing? Sorry? Probably for 8, yeah. E of z and sine of z? OK, then I'll do cos of z. Let me just double check. Um,
Okay, good. Yeah, e is e sine of z. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, in the complex plane, I'm going to make these, um, I'm going to make this contour around zero. So a is going to equal zero. So we're going to put in a pole at a equals zero, and we're going to do an integral around a circle with radius equal to one. And we're going to show that this Cauchy integral formula is true. Um, okay, clear all, close all, CLC. We're going to have, um, let's have n equals 1,000 segments in my circle. So let's break my circle up into 1,000 little sectors. We're going to say my integral equals 0 starts at zero, and I'm going to add up the contribution from each of those sectors. And d theta equals 2 pi divided by n. OK, so each of my little wedges, each of my little slices of pi is going to be 2 pi divided by n. n is 1,000. For k equals 1 to n, my theta at that value of k is 2 pi times k divided by n. We're just counting from k, 1 to n. We're going to say my function equals, um, let's say f of z equals cos of z. So my function z is just cos of, sorry, um, z is r times e to the i theta. Right, my variable is r e to the i theta. R is constant 1. And my function, f, is um, going to be cos dz equals i times e to the i theta times d theta. Okay, and my f is going to be cos of z. So all I've done at this point, I've defined some complex variable z, and that complex variable z is going from you know angle zero, increasing all the way to angle two pi. Dz, I'm just taking the derivative of this with respect to theta. I get i r e to the i theta d theta, where d theta is like a little tiny d theta wedge. My function is cos. And we're going to have i equals i plus dz times f. So I'm not doing this integral yet. First of all, I'm just integrating around cosine. So what does a closed contour integral around the function cosine equal? I'm really hoping this is 0, because I know cosine is analytic. Uh, test CIF. Okay, and I should probably output what I is. And in fact, my output is within machine precision of zero. Right? Tiny, 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 tiny real part plus tiny, 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 tiny imaginary part. Good. So we verified that this contour integral around a unit radius circle of an analytic function is zero. Should we try a different analytic function? Let's try a different one. Let's try sine of z. Um, also 0. Let's try e to the z. Also 0. OK? But now let's try to add in divided by z. OK, so let's try this formula where we're doing the same contour integral around a unit radius circle of an analytic function, cos of z, divided by z. So I'm adding in a singularity at z equals 0. So let me just try to write this out so that we know what we think the answer should be. OK, so if we did this integral of c of cos of z divided by z dz, what should this equal? 
Okay, 2 pi i times what? Times f evaluated at z equals 0, which is 1, times cos of 0. So this should equal 2 pi i, if I don't mess anything up. Okay, so we're integrating this function f equals cos of z divided by z around a closed contour integral, and we're testing that the Cauchy integral formula is true, and it is. The answer after I integrate all thousand of these little sectors around the circle is 0 plus 2 pi i. It's exactly what we think it should be. Okay? It's nice. You can actually integrate these things. If you wanted to, you could create some nasty curve and integrate around that. That would still work. It's a little harder to do in MATLAB. I mean, you can do the same thing for the homework problem, e to the z. Um, sine of z over z is a little interesting. Any ideas why sine of z over z is different? Why is that zero? Because sine of zero is zero. So sine of z over z is in fact analytic. Because the Taylor series for your sine has you know, powers of, it, it has a z in every term. So you can divide that z out and you still get a convergent Taylor series. Interesting. So sine of z over z is analytic. Um, okay, that's basically everything I wanted to tell you today. Um, that's a good place to stop. We have this extraordinarily useful formula. We can prove why it's true. Um, it's only true for z minus a, you know, it's only true if you divide by one power of z minus a. If you had five powers, that would be different. It would be zero. And we can also show that this is true in MATLAB. Okay, so next time we're going to start doing real difficult integrals using this. Like just, we're going to try new integrals. And we're also going to show how to do inverse Laplace transforms by hand. Okay, good.